In this lecture, our subject is a buckling of plate. The first thing to keep in mind whenever you discuss stability of structures is that instability can only occur in nonlinear systems. So if you have a linear structure in which the strain displacement relationship is linear, that structure cannot be subject to instability. Linear systems are either always stable or always unstable. There is nothing we can do about it. Stability of linear systems don't depend on the loading. So whenever you talk about buckling, you talk about nonlinearity. So in order to develop equations which will allow us to describe the buckling response of plates, we have to take some nonlinear strain displacement relations into account. And this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start from moderate rotations. So instead of using linear strain displacement relationships, we are going to use the moderate rotation expressions, which we have derived in our basics uh, lectures. The displacement field was given by u being minus z w comma x, v being minus z w comma y, and w being a function of x and y, and not dependent on z. So the vertical motion is uniform through the thickness. And this satisfied the Kirchhoff conditions up to second order. So these equations are valid already up to second order in, in, in rotation, which is wx and wy. And for this reason, we don't need to modify the displacement field if we're talking about moderate rotation. So this displacement field is valid under the moderate rotations assumption. OK. So in order to calculate strains when we have moderate rotations, we need to calculate the three rotation components around x, y, and z. So what we'll have here is rotation around x is w comma y minus v comma z. over 2. So w comma y is w comma y minus v comma z is minus w comma y which is 2 w comma y and this means that Vx is just w comma y. 2 Vy is equal to u comma z minus w comma x. Which is going to be minus Two times minus two W X then we will have V Z which is going to be V comma X minus U comma Y V comma X is nothing other than minus z w x y minus 
u comma y is minus z w y x, which is again x y because order of differentiation doesn't make any difference. This will be a zero. So at the end of the day, we can write down our rotations. Phi x is going to be w comma y. Phi y is minus w comma x and phi z is equal to zero. So these are our rotations. Then we can calculate our strains. And as usual, we are only interested in in-plane strains. So what we will get here is epsilon x equals u comma x plus one half phi y squared plus phi z squared. And this will give us u comma x plus one half w comma x squared. Epsilon y is going to be v comma y plus one half v x squared plus v z squared, which will give us v comma y plus one half w comma y. And the first term, u comma x, is nothing other than minus z w x x plus one half w comma x squared. And this is nothing other than minus z w y y plus one half w y squared. And gamma x y is u y plus v x plus <coughs> minus v x y and this comes out to be minus 2z wxy plus wx wy so you can easily see here that now our strains are formed of two parts there are parts which depend on z which are linear through the thickness so these we can think of as the bending strains. But once the plate deforms enough that we cannot assume W to be too small, then there will be some stretching of the mid-surface of the plate, which manifests itself in the form of in the form of these terms here, which are strains which are constant across the thickness. All right, so now let us see how virtual work develops for this case. So the virtual work of internal forces minus integration of sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y plus tau xy delta gamma xy dz dx dy. So that's then the definition. 
So now epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma x, y can be split into two parts. Bending strains, and these would lead us to the same bending, the virtual work due to bending that we obtained before, and we are not going to repeat that part. So you can think about it as the internal virtual work is split into two parts. Internal virtual work due to bending, which is exactly the expression we obtained in the previous lecture, plus the internal, the virtual work of internal forces due to stretching. And the one due to stretching is what we're going to derive in this case. So the stretching strains So S here for stretching is double integral. Integration thickness goes from thickness over 2 to thickness over 2. Sigma x dz delta wx squared over 2 plus And here we find that the internal virtual, the virtual work done by internal forces due to this stretching is equal to minus double integration. If you integrate sigma x dz through the thickness, this gives you the resultant force in x direction through the thickness. And this is what we call nx. And this represents force in x direction per unit length of the plate. Correspondingly, we would have ny, which is force per unit length of the plate in y direction, and nxy which is shear force per unit length of the plate. And this is our integration. Because nx, ny, and nxy are in-plane forces, this virtual work is actually, we can think about it as virtual work due to in-plane loading. So this is the virtual work done due to in-plane loading. And we can write it. This is, now we can write this as in-plane. And we would write this in the following form. One half double integral nx delta wx squared plus ny delta w comma y squared plus 2 nx ny delta wx wy dx uy. OK, so now we have derived the virtual work done by internal forces, in plane forces, yeah? OK. So now we are going to make a bold assumption. And that bold assumption is as follows. We know that epsilon x, for example, is minus z w x x plus 
w x squared over 2. This is within the moderate rotation assumption. This is the bending part, this is the stretching part. And the stretching is due to the bending of the plate, because, of course, if you have a straight line like this, you try to bend, then the length is going to change, and this means that you have some stretching of the mid surface, and this is the stretching of the mid surface. So the question now is, even if we have a simple bar, and this is our strain, stretch is proportional to strain by, let's say, Young's modulus, you multiply this by E, so you will see here that your in-plane loading, in X will depend on W. Of course, when you find the resultant of the bending term, it will give you zero force, for sure, because it is anti-symmetric around the origin. So the average bending stress is always zero, so NX due to bending strains is zero. But NX due to the stretching is non-zero, and as such, NX would in general depend on W, and Y will depend on W, and NXY will depend on W. But they don't depend on displacement itself, they depend on displacement squared. So what we do here is that we assume that this dependence can be neglected. So what you do is you apply your in-plane loading to the plate and assume that the plate remains pretty much still flat under the in-plane loading. And as such, what we're going to do by assuming that nx, ny, and xy do not depend on w is that the theory is, will be no longer valid for large deformations but it will be valid only for really small deformations once the plate starts bending. But this is pretty much all what we need to predict buckling, because if you have a plate, you put it under compression, then it will remain flat up to the point of buckling where it will start bending out of plane, and we don't need to go any further than the point of buckling. So the theory we're going to develop is going to help us locate the buckling point, but it will not allow us at all to find what happens after buckling. Okay, so let us see what happens to the virtual work of the in-plane forces once we assume that they don't depend anymore on W, then we can pull delta out and write it in this form. But this means, from the definition of potential energy, that the virtual do work done by in-plane forces is nothing other than minus delta Vi, where I here for in-plane forces, where Vi is nothing other than this expression here. And this already tells us that based on our assumption that in-plane forces are conservative because they are derivable from a potential and this potential can be written in this form. It is not difficult to arrange V in this form here
and we will not use this form of the equation for much other than when we go to prove that um, that buckling cannot occur under pure tension. But in general, we will be using this form of the equation. Okay? So now that we have the potential energy of in-plane loads, we are ready to derive the equations which apply in the presence of in-plane loads. So we are going to find equilibrium equations again by minimizing the total potential energy. So equilibrium equations. So we're going to minimize the sum of strain energy due to merling plus the potential energy due to external load, which is the applied pressure, plus the potential energy due to the in-plane loading, and equate this to zero. This is pretty much what we want uh, to do. OK, very well. So what happens? Of course, the first two parts, we, we already had equations for them from the previous lecture. Now we have an equation for VI. So we proceed integrate by parts in order to obtain the equations of equilibrium and the boundary conditions. The contribution from in-plane in loading only contains first derivatives with respect to W, which means that these terms will appear only differentiated once and they will contribute only to the shear boundary conditions, not to the bending boundary conditions. The details of the derivation can be found in the document included in, uh, in the lectures. And as the, I'm going just to state the final result. The final result is, again, B times the fourth order terms, the fourth order derivative terms. And then what you do, you get a minus sign. And then you have the in-plane terms. And these are going to be mx, w, comma, x, with respect to x, plus NY, WY, comma, Y, plus NXY, W, comma, X, comma, Y, plus NXY, W, comma, Y, comma, X, equals Q, where Q is the applied pressure. And this is the equilibrium condition in the presence of in-plane loading. In general, nx, ny, nxy can be functions of both x and y. So not only can we deal with problems, for example, where we have a plate under uniform tension or compression, like this, But we can also deal with problems where the in-plane loading is bending. So you can have in-plane bending of a plate, in which case the in-plane load distribution might look something like this. Of course, problems where 
in x in y in x y depend on x and y become a little bit difficult because that it's not only just a partial differential equation but with non-constant coefficients. So we are going to stick to the simpler case where in x in y in x y are constants in which case we can pull them out of the differentiation. In which case the equation will simplify And this is the equation we would like to solve, subject to boundary conditions as far as the bending moment conditions, rotation conditions are concerned, they are the same as standard theory. Uh, if W is not fixed and you have shear boundary conditions, they would be slightly altered in the presence of in-plane loading, but we are not interested uh, in this very much because uh, we will deal only with simply supported uh, plates. Okay, so this is our partial differential equation and we need to see if we can solve it for uh, cases which are relevant in practice. And the case we are going to solve is going to be the following. Again, a plate which is simply supported on all sides. So on every side W is zero and the derivative, second derivative is also zero. So this is X is y, this is z, here again w is 0, and w x x 0, here w y y is 0, and w is 0, here we have w equals 0, and w y y also equals 0. So these are the boundary conditions and constant in plane loading, so this would be an extension of Navier solution to the case of in plane loading. All right, so if we go back and look at the governing equation, the trick with Navier solution was that only even derivatives appeared in the partial differential equation. If we look at what we have here, we see that there is a mixed derivative w comma x y that appears, which is an odd derivative with respect to x and an odd derivative with respect to y. And as such, this term cannot appear if we're going to have a Navier-like solution. So Navier solution requires us to assume that the in-plane shear is identically zero. So we can only have biaxial compression or tension in order to find a closed form solution or a series solution a la Navier. So what you have here is, again, we make the assumption that W is some sort of a coefficient times two sine terms, and this will satisfy the boundary conditions. And then we proceed and substitute this into the partial differential equation and equate both sides. So if we substitute this into the partial differential equation, we, op we see that we will have d 
times m pi over a all squared plus n pi over b all squared all squared plus nx m pi over a squared plus n y n pi over b squared a m n sine m by x over a sine n pi y over b equals q. So this is going to be what we get. So if a is sinusoidal, we find that q is also sinusoidal. And q has the form q equals a m n sine m by x over a and sine n by y over b where a m n and a capital a m n are related by this relationship that a m n is equal to All square. All right. So this is what Navier says that a sinusoidal pressure loading will lead to sinusoidal displacement response. But we have a slightly modified relationship between the pressure coefficients and the displacement coefficients. Question is. And it's an interesting question to uh, consider here. So what's the difference between this and what we had before? Not really a big deal. Finding the coefficients of the pressure series, because in general, if the pressure is not sinusoidal, then we express Q as a series. and write it as the sum of sinusoidal terms where m and n are integers. Finding these coefficients is exactly the same as we did for the classical Navier solution where we didn't have in-plane loading. And then once we have the small a's we can calculate the capital A's. And from there, we have our displacements. We have our displacement. We have our bending resultants, and so forth and so on. And we can calculate our stress distribution. Nothing uh, too complicated. Of course. The only thing to keep in mind is that your stress distribution in this case is going to be slightly different from what we had before. Because now we have in-plane loading, the stresses will not only be linear in Z, there will be also stresses which are constant through the thickness due to the in-plane loading. So our stress distribution will be given by sigma x would be nx over thickness minus 12 over thickness cubed mx 
times z. Sigma y will be ny over thickness minus 12 over thickness cubed my times z and tau xy is going to be nxy over thickness minus 12 over thickness cubed myx times z. So the only difference is that there will be a shift in the neutral axis for stresses. So instead of having the stress as the mid plane equals zero, it will be non zero in the presence of in plane loading. Other than that, everything goes exactly as in the classical case where we didn't have any in plane loads applied. All right, so this is so far so well. Now we come to a discussion of buckling. In Navier's solution, we had a relationship between displacement response and loading. So small a represents loading, because these are the coefficients in the pressure series. And capital A rep represent displacement, because these are the coefficients in the displacement series. All right, so this is the equation we have here. If nx is greater than 0, and ny is greater actually or equal 0, then we know that the denominator is always positive. Yeah? So if amn is finite, so if the coefficients of the load are finite, which they are always finite even if we have concentrated force as we have seen in the previous lecture, then the coefficients of the displacement series are finite and the AMN will also converge very quickly to zero. So we have a convergent series and displacement is finite. But this might not be exactly the case if we have compression. If either nx or ny is sufficiently negative, or both of them, then we can have a situation where the denominator becomes zero. And if the denominator becomes zero, this means that either that your plate will have non-zero bending for zero loading. So if AMN is zero, but the denominator is zero, then you get zero over zero, which is indeterminate. Or that for finite loading, you get infinite displacement. Of course, the theory we're working with, as I said in the beginning, since we assumed NX and NY and XY, we don't depend on W, will work only for small w. So as soon as your, your, your prediction is that w's are large, then you know that you're no longer valid. But it already tells you that the displacement will grow. And what happens after they grow in magnitude, we cannot predict anymore. Of course, they would never go to infinity. In either case, this defines buckling. Either you define buckling as loss of stability so that you will have non-zero uh, deflection under zero loading, under zero, so you'll have non-zero lateral deflection under zero lateral loading, or you can define it as excessive deformation under out-of-plane load. Both are good definitions for buckling. 
So end of story is buckling condition is we set the denominator to be equal to zero. And since buckling occurs for compression, we are going to write that equation in this form. And this is condition for button. There are a few things to notice here. And the first thing to notice is that this condition will depend not only on plate properties like plate stiffness D or plate dimensions A and B, it will also depend on N and M. And N and M are arbitrary integers. And this means that there is not a single buckling possible of a plate. Plate may buckle in different shapes. And depending on the shape it will buckle in, there will be a different buckling level. And of course, in reality, the smallest level will correspond to the buckling load you will see in practice. So this is the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is, but what is the meaning of buckling load, bu buckling load level? If we had a single loading on the plate, for example, if we had only nx and ny is 0, then we can talk about the load value at which we obtain buckling. Fair enough, but if we have both in-plane loading in X and Y, what does it mean, buckling load level? Does it the value of NX at which buckling occurs, or the value of NY at which buckling occurs, and for which value of the other uh, in-plane load are we calculating our buckling values? So this leads people to define what we call interaction curves. So this is, let's say, Nx. This is compression. And this is Ny. If you apply only nx, you will buckle at a certain value. If you apply only ny, you will buckle at a different value. In between, the values of nx and y and ny that will satisfy the buckling equation will fall on a curve. And this curve is always such that the area inside the curve is convex. And this is called interaction curve. All right. So let us say I have a plate, and I have the interaction curve for the plate. And let's say I know that loading is nx equal to 1, some unit force per unit length, and ny is equal to 2. So for example, we have a point here. So this point on this diagram here represent the actual loading in the plate. OK, so since we are inside the interaction curve, we know that we, the plate is stable under this loading. If we loaded the plate and the point was outside the interaction curve, then we know it is unstable. If it is on the interaction curve, then it is critical. All right, 
So, but the question is, for the point we have just indicated here, what is our margin of safety? Naturally, we would think that we would estimate our margin of safety or load factor depending on which one we want to work with based on the distance between the actual loading and the critical loading. But all the points on the interaction curve are critical. So to which point we should we calculate the distance? The engineering approach is to assume what we call proportional loading. So if we're talking about actual loading nx equals 1 and ny equals 2, of course, in compression, so we actually assume that nx is equal to minus lambda and ny is equal to minus 2 lambda. Or lambda is what we call a load multiplier. And proportional loading would be loading along this line here. So this is our loading line. Lambda equals 1 when we have the actual load applied. And there will be a value of lambda at which we intersect the interaction curve. And this is our lambda critical. If lambda critical is larger than 1, then we're, we have a, a, a factor of safety which is larger than 1, which means our structure will not fail under buckling. If lambda critical is less than 1, then we have a factor of safety which is less than 1, which means that our uh, structure has already failed under buckling. And of course, based on the factor of safety, you can estimate the margin of safety. So the basic idea here is that for buckling, we under multiple loads, in this case we have only two, nx and ny, but in practice you can have more. For example, if you're solving this numerically, you can also have in-plane shear. So you have multiple loads applied at the same point. So what we do is we find only a single load multiplier, and this is our buckling level. As, but just by assuming that all applied loads will be increased or decreased proportional to each other up to uh, the buckling level, which can be which can be anything. So this is actually the second thing to uh, keep in mind that when you have multiple loads, you actually don't necessarily need to calculate. Um, a buckling problem trying to find multiple unknowns, you always, by assuming proportional loading, you can reduce the problem to finding a single load amplitude. So we can get more detailed results if we consider the case of uniaxial compression, which is going to be our next step. We will assume ny equals to 0, in which case the value of nx at buckling will have to satisfy this equation. Yep. Of course, we can divide by m pi over a squared, since m is an integer non-zero integer, and m pi over a is, is not zero, in order to get 
the condition for buckling a little bit simplified. With fairly little algebra, we can write this equation as pi squared d over b squared times m b over a oh excuse me m a over b plus n squared over m a over b all squared this is just algebraic rearrangement we see that this here is a non-dimensional factor and this has the correct unit of force per unit length this is usually called buckling coefficient and it is given the symbol k you will see that k depends on three things the first thing that k depends on is the number of half waves in x direction m number of half waves in y direction which is orthogonal to the load or perpendicular to the load n and the aspect ratio of the plate a over b very well so a, a over b is meaningful to talk about because it is part of the geometry of the plate and it does make sense that the buckling load of the plate will depend on whether the plate is a square plate or elongated in the load direction or elongated in the other direction so it does make sense that sh there should be a difference in buckling loads between this plate this plate all of them simply supported on all edges and this plate but what about dependence on M and N this is exactly what we said before that the plate might buckle not only in one shape but in multiple shapes and each buckling mode or buckling shape of these will correspond to a different critical load value and in practice what's important is the lowest one so if we want the critical buckling load what we would like to do is to find so in x critical which is the critical compression value which is going to be a positive value will be k critical pi squared d over b squared where k critical would correspond to the lowest possible value of all buckling modes which means that you take the minimum over m and n of k so trouble is m and n are not continuous variables if they were we would have differentiated but these are integers you cannot differentiate with respect to integers so the standard way is to enumerate so you start trying values of m and n you scan values m and n from one to a large number and you find the minimum and this is your uh, buckling load in this particular case things are not that bad because we know that k is equal to m Uh, excuse me, I uh, I copied wrong. Uh, this is uh, B over A, and this is A over B. So this is going to be B over A, and this is indeed A over 
P. So it is M over R plus N squared over M times R all squared. So this is going to be our buckling factor. And we see that K is an increasing function of N. If you increase N, K always increases at a fixed value of M and R. So the minimum always will occur at the smallest possible value of the number of half waves or the number of sine half waves in Y direction. And this means that the most critical case is N equals 1. So if you have a simply supported plate, it will always buckle in perpendicular direction in one half wave. So it's always one half wave in the direction perpendicular to the load. How many waves in the direction of the load, we don't know. But then we can consider only the case k equals m over r plus r over m whole squared. And it is our job now for a given value of r, which defines the geometry of the plate, to find the minimum value of k by changing m from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth, and so on. We cannot judge about m because it's very clear that for a given r, the first term increases, with m increases, the second term decreases. So there will be some sort of a minimum somewhere in between, which we cannot tell beforehand. And we cannot find it by differentiation, because m is not a real number. So classically, what people do in this case is that they create a buckling chart. where they plot different curves for k as function of plate aspect ratio for fixed values of m. So for example, for m equals 1, you find a, a curve that looks something like this. And then for k equals 2, we will find a curve that looks like this. And for k equals 3, we'll find a curve that looks something like this and so forth, and so on. So this is m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 3. And we see that each curve has a certain minimum. And finding the minimum is not difficult, because m is fixed. So k is equal to m over r plus r over m all squared. So if we differentiate what's inside the bracket equated to 0 to find where we have the minimum, we get minus m over r squared plus 1 over m equals 0. And this tells us that r equals m. So if m equals 1, the minimum buckling factor will occur at r equals 1. For m equals 2, it's r at r equals 2. And the minimum for r equals m equals 3 will occur at r equals 3, and so forth, and so on. When r equals m, then the two terms inside the, bra the bracket are equal to 1. 1 plus 1 is 2 squared is 4. So k minimum over each curve is 4. So we do know that our critical buckling factor is always greater than or equal 4. It will be equal exactly to 4 if the aspect ratio is an integer number. Other than that, it will be greater than 4. And you will see here 
a very interesting fact that the buckling of the plate up to a certain aspect ratio somewhere between 1 and 2 will always occur in one mode so you will have only one, one half wave in load direction because this is the lowest value of K but after that after that specific aspect ratio you will see that the plate will buckle in M equal 2 because K corresponding to M equal 2 will be smaller than K corresponding to M equals 1 and so forth and so on so there will always be a value of aspect ratio at which the plate will switch buckling mode from M equal 1 to M equal 2 and from M equal 2 to M equal 3 and then to 4 and 5 and so forth and so on and if we want to find this value we just equate the key values for two successive values of M so what we do is we equate M over R plus R over M to M plus 1 over R plus R over M plus 1 and this is really nothing other than M over R plus 1 over R plus R over M plus 1 M over R plus R over M so this cancels and then we get 1 over R equals R times 1 over M minus 1 over M plus 1 which is nothing other than R over M M plus 1 so solving from this we get R equals square root M times M plus 1 so for between 1 and 2 we switch at square root 2 between 2 and 3 we switch at square root 6 between 3 and 4 we switch at square root 12 and so forth and and so on okay so that was buckling under uniaxial compression which is the only case we will analyze in details if you have biaxial loading then you can assume proportional loading and use the buckling equation in order to find the minimum value of the load multiplier lambda and this you will have to do by uh, trial and error of m and n m and n values of course in general we might not be able to find exact solutions at all either because the geometry is complicated the plate is not rectangular for example or because for example we have shear because we have already seen that under in-plane shear we cannot obtain an AVA solution in that case we cannot solve the problem exactly and what we do is we use the Raleigh Ridge method in order to estimate uh, buckling uh, load and this is what we're going to discuss next the last topic we're going to cover in this lecture is the relationship between uh, buckling and, and energy so we have seen already that we can define buckling two ways either very large deformation under finite lateral loading or indeterminate deformation in the impending deformation under zero lateral loading so So what we're going to do is to consider the case where we have no lateral loading and our total energy is U plus Vi where 
Vi is the potential energy of the in-plane load. The expression for U is quadratic in displacement, and the expression of in-plane load is quadratic in displacement. and linear in the applied in-plane load. Yeah? Okay. So if we replace the in-plane loads by a load multiplier in order to work with proportionate loading, then VI will be multiplied by lambda. So if you multiply these by lambda, then this is also multiplied by lambda. So in general, the total loading is U plus lambda VI, or VI depends only on NX, NY, and N xy as parameters and depend on the unknown displacement w. u will depend only on, on the unknown displacement w. And lambda is our unknown buckling load multiplier, which will decide on the factor of safety for buckling of, the, of our plate. Equ equilibrium says that delta u plus lambda vi is equal to zero. And this would give us the equilibrium conditions at the point of buckling. So that's pretty straightforward. And this will lead to the same banding equations as before. We'll just replace nx by lambda nx, ny by lambda ny, and xy by lambda and xy. And the right-hand side will be zero, because here we don't have any lateral pressure. So that's pretty much OK. But what would be the correct value of lambda to choose? What the value of lambda at which buckling will occur. So let us assume that we have a displacement clamp. Our displacement is W. And that we increase the displacement by a factor, a certain amplitude, A. So since U is quadratic in W and V is quadratic in W, our total potential energy is going to end up being A squared times u plus lambda vi, where u and vi are both function of w. A is just the multiplier by which we multiply our displacements. So now, if instead of minimizing with respect to all possible displacements, we just assume that we just change only the amplitude of the whole displacement of the plate, then minimizing total potential energy or setting it to uh, to be stationary, which is the condition of equilibrium, just say that we differentiate with respect to A and set to zero. And this would give us A times U plus lambda VI equals zero. And in general, this will the solution for this would be a equals zero, which would mean zero displacement amplitude. So the pla the plate is is going to remain flat; it will not bend unless we have a critical condition where u plus lambda v i equals zero, and this would be the condition for buckling. So the displacement at buckling will satisfy u plus lambda vi equals 0, where lambda is the critical value 
of uh, our load multiplier, which is the value at which buckling occurs. It's very interesting also to see total potential energy is is quadratic in 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 amplitude. So if this is amplitude, this is total potential energy. If u plus lambda vi is positive, this energy is convex like this. So this is u plus lambda vi greater than zero. So that's why they're stable. If it is less than zero, it is a parabola in the opposite direction which doesn't have a minimum at A equals zero, but a maximum. And that's why we are unstable. And the critical condition is exactly when it is zero. And this is actually the point at which you can have a non-zero amplitude. So essentially, for lambda lower than the value u plus lambda vi equals zero, you are stable. After that, you are you are unstable. And this tells us that lambda critical is equal to u over minus v of the in-plane loading. u is strain energy, bending strain energy, which is always positive. So in order to have a positive lambda critical, which means you, you load in the same direction in order to buckle, vi has to be negative. And if we recall the expression we obtained before for vi, we wrote it in matrix form. And it took the form wx wy times mx mxy mxy ny wx wy dx, dy. So if this matrix here, which is just the tensor, it's really the tensor of the in-plane stress, in-plane loads, which are similar to in-plane stresses. If this is positive definite, or even semi-definite, then vi is always positive. And as such, lambda critical cannot be positive, because if vi is always positive, and lambda critical is minus u over v, u is always positive, v is always positive, so lambda is always negative. So the only way to buckle is to reverse the direction of the loads. So no buckling can occur if nx, nxy, nxy, and why this matrix is the in-plane stress resultance uh, is positive definite or positive semi-definite. And this would mean that the eigenvalues would be non-negative. So the principal stresses are non-compressive. So if principal loads, which are similar to principal stresses, these are the eigenvalues, are non-negative, which means non-compressive, no buckling can occur. And what this means is that buckling requires at least one of the two principal stresses to be compressive. If you have at least one of the two principal stresses compressive, then buckling will occur. If both principal stresses are tensile, buckling can never occur. And that's why we always associate buckling with compression, at least for beams. But for plates, it is very important to note that you don't have to have honest to gut compression to buckle, yeah? Because we're talking about principal stresses here. We're not talking about 
loading in the direction of the plate. So for example, if you have intent here, we know that implant shear is equivalent to at 45 degrees it is equivalent to tension in one direction which is equal to an xy and to compression in the other direction which is equal again to an xy and this means that under shear you would get a compressive principal stress and if you have compressive principal stress, then buckling will occur. So you can buckle under shear, you can buckle under compression. And unfortunately for wings, these are the two loads which are predominate under wing bending. So the skin of the wing, the, if the wing is bending up, the upper skin will be under combined compression because of bending and shear because of torsion so buckling is naturally very important for aerospace applications because plates are sensitive both to shear and uh, and direct compression so both of them can cause uh, can cause buckling this is the last topic we're considering in this lecture Thank you.